Dear chess friend, you're about to see another refreshing attacking game, so better buckle up. White is answering the Karo Khan with the mainline knight c3 and black responses with the Capablanca variation bishop f5. We have discussed this before in a previous video. In that set video, I presented the mainline h4, which goes like this, h4, h6, knight f3, knight d7, h5, bishop h7, bishop d3 and so on and so forth. This is how white has to play if he wants to put black under substantial pressure. In this game, however, Godena opted for a sideline, bishop c4. Strictly speaking, this is a feeble move because it doesn't yield any opening advantage for white whatsoever. However, black has to know his way around and there is ample opportunity to go astray, as we can see in the present game. e6, and now Godena played knight e2. If knight f3, knight g7, there is nothing white can hope for here in this position. Black has no weakness and there is no way to break black's fortress, so this is a dead equal position. Godena played knight g e2, intending to push the f pawn down the board to f5, namely. This is what happened in this game. Knight f6, and now Godena castled. Let's just briefly look at what he could have done otherwise. For instance, h4, threatening h5. So black has to create a refuge for the bishop on h7. Now knight f4, bishop h7. And now knight h5 is an interesting idea to put some pressure on the g7 pawn, but it also comes with a certain cost. Knight bd7, c3. Black simply plays rook g8 because he is not depending on castling short. He can castling to the queen side as well. Queen e2, bishop d6, and the engine gives this as equal. White has also some problems with his king because if he castles king side, the h4 pawn is becoming weak. Castling queen side with black's bishop on h7 also doesn't look very appealing. Now, in this position after knight f6, another option is knight f4. Bishop d6 and now h4. So as now the knight is already on f4, black of course cannot play h6 anymore. But he is ready to put pressure on the f4 knight by queen c7. Now white has two choices. One is a direct h5. <clears throat> Black now has to do the desperado by taking on c2. And as the knight is hanging on f4, white plays the counter desperado. Knight takes e6, fe queen c2, takes takes. Oh, this is pretty forced and after knight e5 black has an extra pawn but the engine is merciful to white and says that white has just about enough compensation after queen c7 another idea for white could be queen f3 defending the knight of course giving black the opportunity to take the pawn c2 now White has to show something for the sacrifice. So knight h5 is uh, some constructive idea to do so. Now the g7 pawn is hanging. Black can give the check on h5, but the safest line is rook g8, castles. Now white has an evil threat of playing bishop g5, after which bishop takes e6 would be deadly. So black has to castle away before this happens, giving up the f7 pawn. Bishop g6, queen f3, rook f8, queen e2, knight b6, giving up another pawn on e6. And here black has enough compensation. I would prefer black's position because white has some weaknesses. The d4 pawn is weak and also the h4 pawn. And white's king side doesn't inspire too much trust here. So 
black will play the knight to d5 and has some attacking chances maybe. So this position is equal as well. Now back to the game. Gudena, uh, Gudena he played castle uh, instead of h4 or knight f4, which we just saw. Bishop um, d6. And now Gudena played the move f4. f5 is the ideal, most obviously. But the whole uh, game plan why it has here in this line is flawed in my perspective because black now has so many good lines available for instance could he just prevent f5 with queen d7 or even with bishop f5 both lines are completely fine for black after f4 he could also just let f5 happen and play um, knight bd7 f5 takes 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 castles now you might say well White has the bishop pair and has an extra pawn in the center. Isn't he better? The answer is no, because White's kingside is quite weak. For instance, the h2 pawn is soft. And then White hasn't yet uh, completed his development. And there is this problem here with the e4 square. Let me give you uh, one bad line for White, which illustrates just that. Bishop g5, that's still okay. Queen c7, and now uh, the engine says queen e1 has to be played, sacrificing the h2 pawn. If white now would play the normal move, h3, weakening a couple of dark squares on the king side, he would stand clearly worse after knight e4. So, Knight bd7 is completely okay in this position, but in the game, black chose to play queen c7. It's not as good as knight bd7, but it is still playable. Now white plays f5, ef5, knight f5. And this is a very interesting position. Here, black took on h2. So here he was a bit greedy, you might say. But you could also name this, he was courageous or he was principled. The question is, if you see that you can take a pawn and don't see how this can possibly be refuted, what do you do? Some players always go the easy way and say, well, my opponent, he might have thought something, right? There might be some idea behind the pawn sacrifice. But there are other players who are very principled and they just take the pawn whenever they cannot see any refutation. A good example for such kind of player was Viktor Korchnoi. So he liked to take pawns. And also Robert Hübner is a good example for this principled type of player. And now apparently uh, Daniel Roos, he didn't see that bishop h2 could be punished, so he took the pawn. Let's, uh, before we dive into that, see what black should have done with hindsight. Castling leads to equality. For instance, knight takes uh, d6, because now bishop h2 was a threat. Queen takes d6, knight f4. So why is hoping to get some advantages due to his bishop pair. But black has a very strong bishop on g6, defending the king side, also pointing um, at c2, also controlling e4. So this bishop you don't want to give up for the knight. So bishop e4 is a move. Now let's say c3, knight bd7, knight h5 in order to give some scope to the bishop c1 takes takes knight f6 queen h4 bishop g6 now the bishop returns and you see everything is really safeguarded black has a better king here because white has only two pawns so the the pawn shield of white's king consists of only two pawns and black has three that's always good 
And yes, bishop f4 would be normal, queen d7, let's say h3, controlling the g4 square, but after knight d5, rook a1, rook f8, the position is equal. Black's minor pieces are quite active, and uh, the king is quite safe, as I mentioned. So equality here for black. Now, in the game, black took on h2. At first glance, this looks like a good move, actually. How can we punish this with white? Now black is to move again. In the game, he took on f5. He played bishop takes f5. Let's first see what would happen after castles, because as it played out in the game, he, he was deprived of his right to castle. So now we see what would have happened after he castles away into supposed safety. Now the, the main problem is the move g3. Bishop g5 is a good alternative, but g3 is winning. Now you see the problem, the bishop h2 is in acute danger. So what could black do? For instance, could he play bishop f5, rook f5, bishop g3? That's the most natural way of dealing with that problem. Now queen g1 is the point. Of course you cannot go back to d6, as after rook f6 you would be down a piece. Um, bishop h4, defending the knight on f6, of course, is an alternative, but after bishop h6, threatening checkmate, g6, takes, takes, rook f4, you see the bishop h4 again has problems, cannot be saved because after g5, white could simply take the knight on f6. That leaves us with knight e4. The knight is defending the bishop. Now after queen e3 attacking the knight, the knight cannot move backwards because the bishop g3 would be hanging. So uh, knight f2 check, king g2. Now the bishop g3 is hanging again, so bishop h4 only move. And now rook f7 wins on the spot because if you take the rook, it's checkmate in one. Uh, queen e8 checkmate. So after g3, what can black do otherwise? He could play queen d7. So before we had bishop f5 takes, followed by bishop takes g3, but that, that didn't really work out well. So now the queen is attacking the knight, f5. Bishop d3, defending that knight. And now knight g4, the only way to save the bishop on h2. Knight c3. Now this is a funny constellation with the knight g4, the bishop h2. Now the knight is under attack. <coughs> no, not like that, of course. Uh, sorry for being sloppy here. Queen takes g4 as a threat, of course. So h5, what else? Bishop g5, finishing the development. Um, what can black do? Knight e7 now, check, uh, I think, is um, in the cards, right? So it is natural to prevent this with f6. The bishop goes back to d2. And now there is this peculiar dependency uh, between knight g4 and bishop h2. Uh, in the long run, the bishop h2 will be doomed. I'll give you a, a longer line here uh, without just going uh, left or right. This is not really the topic of the game, but I'll, just, I'll give you one line to prove that the bishop really is doomed on h2. Just very quick, right? This is all. This is all um, confirmed by the engine, of course. But I cannot really do anything to uh, liberate the bishop h2. And now, finally, let's say f5, knight f2. Here you see the problem. White is just exchanging the defending knight g4, finally winning the bishop. Um, if instead of f5, king g7, white could just attack the bishop like this. Mm, and now also play knight f2, finally netting material. So that was the move castles after king h1. We saw that with g3, 
White could finally win the bishop on h2. The game, black played, uh, bishop takes f5, rook f5, and now he went back with his bishop to d6 before white plays g3. Let's, before we are going there, have a look at knight bd7. So can't black just castle away to the queen side? Uh, because in the game he was stuck uh, in the center with his king. Now knight f4 is very strong. A different way of cutting off um, the bishop, interrupting the communication between the queen c7 and the bishop h2. Now if the bishop took on f4, bishop f4, attacking the queen, queen b6, you see the problem. Black's king is caught in the middle of the board. Going to d8 is now best, but the king can never go to safety because the bishop f4 takes away the c7 square. This would be lost because black's peace coordination would be uh, lousy in that case. So a better try maybe in a, in a practical game would be king f8, but this is uh, actually inferior, it's losing outright. Bishop d6 check. Now we might just uh, pause a bit, try to find the best move for white. We can click on pause, so I, I will show it now. Queen e6 exclamation mark, that's the way to punish black. The queen is untouchable and queen f7 takes is the threat. So black has to play rook f8. Now black uh, is hoping for bishop takes f8 because then um, black could take the queen on e6. But rook f6 is a good move here. Knight f6 and now queen e7 <clears throat> attacking the, the rook. And the rook cannot move because of checkmate on f7. So this line simply doesn't work. Black cannot take with the bishop on f4. Let's see... An alternative line, castles, king h2. Now black uh, has some hopes here left because there is a pin in place. Um, and the rook f5 has not that many squares. So for instance, rook g5 would be a severe mistake after knight e4. Let's say rook g4, h5, rook h4, g5. Finally, Black is winning some material. The knight f4 is falling, and that would be good for black. But in this position here, white can simply resort to the strategy of giving back material in order to simplify the position. Rook takes f6, knight f6. Now unpinning the knight before g5 happens, and here we can take stock. White has two bishops against rook and pawn, but um, normally the two bishops are just so much stronger and this gives white a clear advantage in this case. So after rook takes f5, the move knight bd7 is answered with knight f4 with a clear advantage for white. That's why in the game black retreated with the bishop. We have seen the bishop being trapped with g3 on knight f4. So bishop d6 is a very logical move. And now, of course, black is um, prepared to either castle short. Of course, this is risky because of rook takes f6. But if black was to move, he would, mm, I think, play knight bd7 and then castle queenside. And of course, then white would have a problem with his uh, naked king on h1. Well, what to play? Give it some seconds, give it a minute to think about it, press on stop again. I will now show the solution. But before I show the solution, I, I just show the second best move. The second best move is a knight c3, but this gives black uh, an opportunity to equalize after Knight bd7, threatening to play uh, queenside castling. Check. 
It's the only way to prevent black from doing so. King f8. And now white has enough compensation for the pawn after queen f3, rook e8, bishop g5, rook e7, rook f1. But black now moves the king um, out of the danger zone um, and is about to play king d8, king d8, king c8. White has enough compensation because there's a lot of pressure down uh, the f-file here on black's position, but it's equal. No advantage for white. Actually, here in this position, white has to find our topical move. Bishop h6. That's it. Our bishop h6 device, putting enormous pressure on the complex g7 f6. Now, in our game, black played rook g8, but that was not the best move. The best move here is g takes h6, rook takes f6, attacking the f7 pawn, queen f7. Now, white shouldn't take here on f7 with the rook because of queen has 4 check. White has a bit of an advantage left, but not that much. The better move here is rook f3. So after queen h4 check, we could play um, rook h3. Now, um, as bishop f7 here in this position, bishop takes f7 check was a threat. Black has to castle. But after queen d3, white has uh, for this uh, pawn he gave, and it's, uh, well, not really a full pawn. Black has doubled h pawns, as you can see. White has a lot of compensation, overcompensation. White has good attacking chances against Black's um, weakened king side. So this is a clear advantage for White. And that was the best case scenario. Another move, um, apart from g takes h6, is castling short. This was not played in the game. I said uh, rook g8 was the game move. Let's have a look uh, at this move here. Rook f6, of course, disrupting black's kingside structure. Now there are two lines. gh6, queen d3, and mm, now there's an attack against the point h7. For instance, knight g7, rook takes h6, threatening checkmate. This is uh, lost instantly. So after rook f6, Black has to take the rook and not the bishop. Gf6, but that looks also very dangerous. Queen f1, threatening queen takes f6, followed by queen g7 checkmate. Now let's see the two moves. Knight g7, defending the, G, uh, defending the f pawn is one, but queen f5 is coming. Threatening queen g4 check, followed by queen g7 checkmate. King h8 only moved, but this runs into bishop d3, and now we see a mate on h7. The very next move. So this is no solution for black. After queen f1, let's have a look at bishop e7, defending the pawn uh, this way. Queen f5, threatening bishop d3 to build the battery. Queen d7, the queen has to be challenged outright. But after queen h5, king h8, uh, bishop f8 takes rook f1. White has a winning attack. He wants to play knight g3, bishop d3. And you see black has no resources to defend the king. Now, let's finally come to our game. Rook g8 looks like a good move, actually. Because now white cannot take the pawn here in order to undermine the knight because after bishop takes g7 question mark rook g7 rook f6 queen e7 rook f3 knight e7 black is slightly better he is about to castle queen side and then white's king is of course much weaker than black's this is not good for white white has now to play a very strong move and this is knight f4 leaving the bishop hanging on h6 but of course this is not a problem for the time being 
And now the, the threat, the main threat is now knight h5. Um, in order to yeah play um, knight takes g7, the next move, or bishop takes g7, or knight takes f6, depending on what black does. So knight h5 would be winning on the spot if white was to move again. Another good way to improve the position would be queen f3 followed by rook e1 check. This was, uh, would also win if white could play now queen f3. But it is black's move. Now there are a couple of moves for black available. In the game he played queen d7. Let's have a look at the alternatives. Queen e7 was played in another game. Sequeira, Großpeter, Skin, 1979. And here we could, uh, we can improve on White's play by Queen f1, threatening Rook e1. This is winning quite quickly. Another try would be Knight bd7, um, strengthening the point f6, intending to castle away, but this is not going to happen after Queen e2 check. Now, King f8 is one move and this is punished in a nice way. Knight e6 check. Attacking king and queen, so this is forced. And now queen f7 checkmate or also queen takes g8 is threatening. And this is game over. If the knight d7 moves to b6, rook takes f6 wins on the spot. So this is not working. After queen e2, the only interesting move here is bishop e7. Rook e1, threatening checkmate. Now there are two moves. One is castling. Now I think queen takes e7 is not good because of rook e8. So bishop f7 is our move here. g8, 6, queen e7. Rook g8, bishop e6, pinning the knight being unpinned, but after uh, this liquidation here, bishop d7, knight d7, white is finally winning an exchange. After rook e1, instead of castling uh, queenside with, which we just saw, knight b6 was played in two games. Now um, bishop takes f7 is the best move. Rook e5 also was winning in the game Cabanos Bravo against Núñez Muñoz, Madrid 2018. But bishop f7 is stronger. King f7, that's a, um, was a novelty by the way, bishop f7. And now queen e6 check, where can the king go? Let's say king e8, then we play. Rook takes f6, threatening queen takes g8, winning. So the king must move to f8, defending the rook g8. But now uh, there's a pin in place. Rook f6 takes, takes, queen f7, and now we have a checkmate here. So all of these moves, be it queen e7 or knight bd7, just lose. In the game, black played queen d7, attacking the rook, which is defended by the queen, and now the idle rook a1 is brought into play. This is a good standard strategy. If you are attacking, try to bring all your resources into the attack. Knight a6, trying to castle away, but this is not happening after rook e1 check. Now, if the king would go to the right side, there would be a direct uh, win. Rook f6, followed by rook takes f7. So this is not working. The king has to go to the left side of the board. King d8, and now comes finally the underminer, bishop takes g7. Now, black played knight g4, that was a mistake. Let's now first have a look at the better move, rook takes g7. Rook takes f6. White has now uh, equalized in terms of material and uh, is left with a winning advantage because mm, his pieces are so much more active and of course black as you can see has problems with his king stuck at the center. Let's say b5, I'll give you just one uh, line here, 
if black now plays bishop f4, rook f4, king c7 in order to bring the rook a8 into play, d5, disrupting black's structure. Um, white is working his way towards black's king. This is winning. After bishop b3, there's also the move king c7 instead of taking on f4. The idea is uh, rook e8 or even better queen g4. If black was to move, queen g4 would equalize actually. But white plays and uses his extra tempo by playing bishop e6, completely um, putting black's um, position into a chaos. Black cannot organize his forces, cannot play the queen to g4, but cannot bring his rook a8 into play. Also cannot take that um, bishop. If this happens, then after takes, white would simply win the exchange. If the queen would move to d8, queen f5 would be winning, defending the knight f4 or another time, attacking the f7 pawn. So bishop takes f7 is the threat. Of course, the rook f6 needs protection, and now bishop f7 would be the next move. So after um, bishop e6, queen e7 is a move, and now there is a, a beautiful move available, queen f1, better than queen f5. Queen f1 is the best move here. You don't have to directly defend the rook f6 because black cannot take it anyways. After queen takes f6, knight d5, check, discovered, uh, a discovered check. No, that's a wrong um, wording. Discovered attack with a check, right? This would be winning the queen. Um, now also the rook e1 is protected. That's the advantage of queen f1 over queen f5. Now, yeah, bishop takes f7 would be a threat. Now after rook f8, we play, for instance, bishop h3. King d8, and now there's a beautiful move coming. I don't say it's the only one, but it's kind of um, using the. It's an aesthetic move also. You know, it's it's the topic. The topic was the square e6 here because you saw um, bishop e6 happening uh, like two moves before, and now this move e6 is used by yet another piece. So this time it's the rook. As we know, the rooks, they are very powerful if doubled on a file, but sometimes it is very effective to double them, double them on a rank, which is happening here because black is very soft on the sixth rank. And that's why white is winning on the spot. Now let's go back to the game. After bishop g7, instead of taking the bishop, which we just saw, white played uh, uh, black played knight to g4 but after knight h5 defending the bishop g7 and intending to take uh, to take the pawn on f7 white was clearly winning something like seven pawns plus eight pawns plus this is what the engine gives us here but of course the chess game is only over uh, when the opponent has stopped the clock. So the game dragged on here a bit. Uh, knight b4 attacking the queen, queen e4. No, that's not the best move, but it's completely sufficient. Rook e8, takes, 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 takes. And now there was a very easy win for black, uh, for white. White should have taken the pawn f7, not with the bishop as he did in the game, but with the rook. Look at the rook on the seventh rank. This doesn't this doesn't come with a check, but it's not important. You know the rook is very powerful, so rook takes b7 could be the next move, and um, black's king is very um, very dangerously placed there where it stands, even without queens. And white has an extra pawn, so let's say knight d5 rook takes b7, it's completely hopeless for black. White is now up two pawns already. So this would have been easy, but he took with the bishop, king e7, 
and now played bishop b3 and I think this is a move he overlooked. I guess he, he wanted to play rook f7 followed by rook takes b7 but now it doesn't work. If rook f7 check, king d8 there is this uh, counterplay available. Rook e1 checkmate is a threat. I think he underestimated that. So he played knight f6, white is still winning here but the margin has uh, shrunken um, quite a bit. Knight f6 takes king d7 and now white made quite a big mistake. He should have played g4 here. The, the threat was um, rook e1 checkmate. So now he gives space for his king on g2 and yeah white has an extra pawn the bishop pair. Let's say black um, tries to uh, seize the second rank. Now white simply uh, does the same by seizing the seventh rank. Knight c2 if black is not grabbing a pawn he has nothing to show for his bad position. Check. And now after g5 white is completely winning because now white will win another pawn the b7 or the a7 pawn while black's king is uh, really vulnerable there on the eighth rank. Imagine white's uh, bishop coming to e6 and then there would be rook g8 check in the cards or white's rook can come from the other side yeah, after taking on b7. So this is clearly winning for white. But white played instead of g4 he played bishop e5 in order to cope with the threat of checkmate on e1. Um, he gave away his bishop pair. The bishop pair was so dominating here and now he has no bishop pair anymore. And now after knight d5 the position was still winning. If white had played rook h5 attacking the pawn and now king h2 the engine still gives like 1.7 plus for white so it's still winning but not by a wide margin anymore. Here you need some technical skills to win. But instead of playing rook h5 here, white made a, now a very serious mistake by taking on d5. And after cd5, the position is only slightly better for white, if better at all, right? So now um, the game um, was played until move 60, where both players finally agreed to a draw. Well, this is typical chess player's fate, right? We, we have seen it in our own games. We had a clear advantage and then we gave it away. This happens, happened to me many times, happens to the best of us. So what we can say here is White really played the first half of the game in a splendid manner by attacking Black, by finding the move for Bishop H6. I hope this game inspired you. Stay tuned. The next Bishop H6 game is very soon to come. Bye.